words, welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. Whether you're joining us live or watching the recording later, it's good to be together in all kinds of ways. If you are joining us on Zoom, please say hello in the chat. Having your chat set for, set for everyone will give us all a chance to see your greetings. Yes, I am speaking from the lectern here in the main hall at Wes. We've got a crew of production volunteers and trainees in the hall practicing for the day when we will have attendees in person here as well as online. And that day arrives next Sunday. Members, take a look at Wes's homepage at ethicalsociety.org. Near the top of the page, you'll, see, you'll find the RSVP link to reserve your seat for in-person platforms in December. That link is for general attendees. Volunteers and SEEK participants should use a separate RSVP link from your staff contact person. Contact Communications Coordinator Robin Kravitz for more information. Our goal is to be a fully hybrid community equally welcoming to those participating online and in person. As we work toward the goal in this experimental time, we will learn from our mistakes and forgive each other generously. I will now read a few of the greetings that have come in by Zoom. While I'm doing that, you might want to get a candle to light during our candle lighting. I understand that we have some folks from the Ethical Humanist Society of Long Island joining us today. Welcome to them and in, to visitors from any of our other sibling ethical societies and Unitarian Universalist congregations, and indeed to all of our visitors from near and far. Visitors, we hope that you'll say hello in the chat and that you might send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, at maceot at ethicalsociety.org. You can also fill out a connection form. Someone will put that link in the chat. So let me see who we have here today. Okay, so got to scroll back up. Um, good morning from Abby Dakin and Jeff Mehal, uh, Peter Bishop, um, Patty Absher, Mark McElreath. Hey, Mark, good to see you. Um, good to see your name, at least. Can't see your face yet, but uh, let's see. Karen Schofield, oops, a whole bunch more came in. Uh, Vivek, good morning, Vivek. Good morning, Karen. Uh, let's see. Brian and Leanne, good morning. Sue Smith, good morning. Christine, good morning. Glad to have you all with us. Let's see. And good morning, Loretta. And Wayne. Okay. Well, that's a good start for the day. And yes, Joe London is here in person, as is Donna Taylor. Great to have you here in the hall. In this season of gratitude, I am grateful that all of you are here today in person or virtually. It's good to connect and share this time together. Opening words this morning are from Professor Charles King of Georgetown University. Common values come out of lived experience of doing horrible things and heroic ones, of being a bewildered newcomer, of imagining ourselves as not always and forever the boss. These also happen to be the habits of mind that enable democracy, accountable government, and the self-criticism necessary for creating a more perfect union, unpedigreed, incorrigible, and confident enough not to worry about being great. We begin our platform with music from Dr. Issei Barnwell. For each child is born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe. For each child is born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe. Who we are, for each child is born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe. Who we are, who we are, 
Good morning again, and welcome back to the Washington Ethical Society. My name is Perry Bider. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the officiant this morning. Our speaker today will be Dr. Michael French. I will introduce Mike more formally before his talk, but I want to take a moment now to acknowledge my own connection to him. Mike and I served together back from 2008 to 2010 as part of a joint West AEU task force, along with the late Michael Culleton and Bart Warden, who is now the AEU executive director. Uh, that task force was charged with investigating the effects of West's dual memberships in the American Ethical Union and Unitarian Universalist Association. And we reported back our findings to the uh, West membership meeting in June 2010 and the AEU assembly that year. It was a real pleasure to work with Mike, and I'm delighted to be the officiant for his talk here this morning. Our chat will stay open through much of the platform service, closing for the address itself, and then reopening. If you don't want to see the chat, it's a good time to minimize it. If you're participating on Zoom this morning, there's also a closed captioning option that can be turned on or off. Each week, we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash readSOP. If you're relatively new to the community or haven't been as active lately, it's an easy way to let folks see your face and hear your voice. Our reader this morning is longtime member Joe London, who serves on the Community Relations Committee and sings in the West Chorus. Joe, the mic is yours. Thank you, Perry. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. 
we invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thank you, Joe. As Joe lights our candle in the hall, I invite you to light your own candle at home if you have one and to join me in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. today is the stories we tell about our American history. To help set the stage, here's a video from our interim music coordinator, Leah Morris, telling a little story about the power of telling stories. incense and pray a specific prayer every time let me tell you how important our stories are. Once there was a rabbi who whenever he sensed that his community was in danger would go into the forest in a very specific spot. He'd light a fire, offer up certain fragrant incense, and pray a specific prayer. Every time, without fail, his prayer was answered and a miracle occurred. When that rabbi passed the mantle on to one of his disciples, that person went into the woods and they lit the roaring fire and they sprinkled in the incense, but they couldn't remember the exact words to the prayer. And they said, God, this is going to have to be enough. And they dwelled in faith. And lo and behold, the miracle occurred and the people were saved. In the next generation, another rabbi took on that role and went into that specific spot and said, I don't know how to start a fire, but I'm here and we need the help. And lo and behold, the prayer was heard and the miracle occurred. In the next generation, the rabbi had forgotten the location, didn't know how to light a fire, couldn't remember specifically which incense or the words to that prayer, but she simply went before the God of her understanding with a request and lo, Behold, the miracle occurred.
let us move into the centering time of our platform. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today, as we focus on the power of stories, I am particularly thinking of the family and friends of the late Stephen Sondheim, and of all of us who have been entertained and moved by the beautiful and challenging music and stories he brought into the world. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. As we continue our moment of mindfulness, I invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze. Wherever you are, whenever you are hearing this, be in that time and place. Take a moment to get as comfortable as you can. Notice the feelings in your body, your posture, your connection with the floor. Notice your breath. Attend to the sensation of breathing in. Attend to the sensation of breathing out. As you continue breathing comfortably, let your thoughts settle down like the water on the surface of a pond when the wind stops blowing. In a moment, I'm going to drop a pebble of an idea into the pond. Then there will be silence, followed by a piece of music. In that time, I invite you to observe what thoughts, feelings, or images that pebble brings up to the surface. Just notice them, let them fade away, and see if any more follow them. Ready? Here's the pebble. The past is just a story we tell ourselves. Good morning, morning Wes. We, we are here and wonderful always, always to be with you. you. I just, I just want, want to frame this song a little, little bit. In the, the bridge, I'll, I'll make a reference to the deity or a personification of a concept that I don't necessarily ascribe to and I understand it is not a word that would be typical in a West conversation, but it was an important to write the, that word into this song to address this concept, this construct, this idea of God blessing America. 
So, so hopefully, hopefully when you hear, hear it, you'll, you'll listen, listen for the, the, the meaning, meaning and not, not just, just that, that specific, specific word. word. Standing on a distant shore, thinking of my home. What did I go wrong for? Just what have I done? Again, our speaker today is Dr. Michael French. Mike is an ethical culture leader and an active member of the National Leaders Council of the American Ethical Union. He first became associated with ethical culture in this very room where he and his late wife, Eileen, were married in 1967. He served as leader of the Baltimore Ethical Society from 1975 to 1984 and is currently affiliate minister at the First Unitarian Church, Baltimore. He is an historian by training, but until his 2007 retirement, he worked in health policy at what was then called the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Now a retired old guy, his words, not mine, Mike gets around Baltimore as much as possible by bicycle, loves dancing and calling English country dances, telling stories, singing, and playing the concertina. He's a board member of the Baltimore City Historical Society and of the Green Burial Association of Maryland. Mike, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to Wes. Thank you very much, Perry. And thank you for <clears throat> recalling our, our time together on the, uh, the committee to uh, consider the joint affiliation of uh, the Washington Ethical Society. Uh, it's, it's good to work together with folks. And it's good to be in this room, which uh, Perry had, had indicated is uh, a very special place for me. It's also good to be, uh, as it were, in the, in the company of the folks from the Long Island Ethical Society. Uh, I really enjoyed my Zoom being with you uh, when I I talked to you 
uh, sometime in the past year. <clears throat> um, it's, it's great to be with all of you. And I hope all of you had a great time a few days ago on Thanksgiving, which is a good way to begin my talk, <clears throat> not to uh, attack the myths of that first Thanksgiving, but uh, it's a good example. You know, some, you get together, I was in a sort of a one generational group, all the people there were my age, but some of you got together in Thanksgiving in two generational uh, gatherings, some three, that would not be uncommon, and some perhaps four. And one of the things you do in these get-togethers is you tell family stories. And one of the things that happens when you tell family stories is you get corrections on the family stories. You know, someone said, oh yeah, remember that time that da 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 da, -da happened? And one of your siblings said, well, yeah, I remember that time, but that's not the way it happened. And uh, someone says, yeah, and that was the captain of the football team. And Oh, when did that happen? I don't remember that. And they said, here, I'll show you. And they pull out a yearbook from the shelf and there's the picture of high school. And your great aunt, Sally, who's uh, now aged and, and you really can't believe that she was once, I know, queen of the garlic festival in 1947 in your home county. And she reaches into her purse and pulls out an old frayed newspaper clipping that shows her as a beautiful young woman at the garlic festival. It's, it's, there's a truth, I think, to the saying that every sibling grows up in a different family. You know, we see things differently <clears throat> because of our place in the family. Well, I think something like this is going on in our discussions in, in the United States today. We're seeing things differently and we're getting all these different ways of looking at our history coming out. Um, it seems that <clears throat> we get tales of some white visitors uh, are really upset with the guides when they go to visit historic plantations in the South and they get shown the slave quarters because they didn't go to these plantations to learn about slavery. They, they, they went to the plantations to kind of live a little bit of the fantasy of Gone with the Wind or movie Westerns and whatever. Uh, as a historian, I think it's important that we have an accurate picture of the past. And as a preacher, I think we must acknowledge the sins of the past. And yes, humanist ministers can talk about sin. Uh, and, and we must acknowledge that the, uh, the sins of the past, if we are to move forward into a righteous future. And yes, humanists can talk about righteousness. We are not responsible for what our ancestors did, but we are, re are responsible for our time, what happens in our time. And what this means is that we have the power to shape the future. What I will do this morning is talk about this changing thing we call American history and explore how it shapes our understanding, not only of the past, but of our present and of our possible future. So let's start what many of us have, at least some of us who are older, learned in school and probably all of us picked up through popular culture. It's a great story with great background music. Here are some of the highlights. The pilgrims and other European settlers came and they started a new nation. And then there was westward expansion, uh, people coming from Europe and moving to the Pacific. You know, old pioneers, you know, wagon trains going west, uh, Bonanza and, and all that. Uh, Manifest Destiny, Cowboys and Indians, John Wayne and Gary Cooper, Gone with the Wind, that great movie that was popular in the 1930s and is still being shown today. This presented a coherent story to both historians and to the general public. Things lead to things that lead to other things. Colonial history built to the revolution and the revolution to the constitution, 
and the Constitution, the President Washington, and so forth. That uh, industrialism led to problems, which led to populism in the progressive era, then the depression and the New Deal, and then defeating fascism, and then to the prosperous 1950s. It was a story of struggle. After all, we killed a lot of people in the Civil War and we killed a lot of Indians, but it was the story of progress. Then along comes a new vision, which we're still learning today. It's only recently hit the general public. Um, this is ongoing. Here are some of the, the new ways of looking at American history. The most prominent of this, of course, is about race and racism. There is a growing awareness that the American economy from the very earliest days, well until the 19th century, was built on slavery, rested at a foundation of enslaved people. All of the colonies, every one of the original 13 colonies had slavery that, you know, there were slaves in New Jersey after slavery ended in Maryland in 1864. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't free those slaves that were still in the process of so-called gradual emancipation in some Northern states. Uh, we've, we've seen, many of us have read the New York Times 1619 project commemorating the arrival of the first enslaved African-Americans in Virginia. We have new language, in fact, to describe this process. We talk about enslaved persons, not about slaves. We talk about slave camps, and not about plantations. We talk about enslavers rather than masters. And there's some, you know, the, rolling realization of things here. In, in 2018, the University of Virginia released a magnificent report entitled Slavery and the University. You know, slaves built those buildings in Charlottesville and the prof early professors had their slaves with them, their enslaved peoples with them. Uh, we have recently been made aware of the awful Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre. In the lifetime of my parents actually. And so in short, we have an awareness that racism was baked into our natural national culture from the very beginning. Let me say that again since I botched that, <laughs> that slavery was baked into our national culture from the very beginning. And this new look at our history, which actually is not so new, this new look about race was only the beginning. As the great historian Carl N. Degler put it in his presidential address to the American Historical Association back in 1986, which is only 35 years ago, Degler said this, the seminal work on the history of slavery in the 1960s stimulated historians to take the same imaginative and probing approaches to the history of cities, blacks, Chicanos, Indians, immigrants, families, and women, and even to transform the history of economy and politics. Uh, thinking back on this statement, I realized, you know, I was in graduate school before women were invented. <laughs> you know, that was just never sort of part of what we studied. Uh, Degler continued, groups and subjects ignored in traditional history suddenly become visible, clamoring for inclusion in a historical framework that once had no place for them. That once had no place for them. And wow, what an outpouring there has been overturning preconceptions left and right. Uh, consider the subjugation of people, of native peoples and other cultures. Uh, you know, 1848, the war with Mexico comes to the conclusion. We take in California and the current states of 
Arizona and New Mexico and also Texas, they all became parts of the United States. Well, Monaco Munoz Martinez, who is a new MacArthur fellow and is a historian at the University of Texas, Austin, is the founder of the Refusing to Forget Project that promotes awareness of the history of racial violence along the US-Mexican border in the early 20th century. She's the author of a book called The Injustice Never Leaves You, Anti-Mexican Violence in Texas, published in 2018. We ignore largely, have ignored largely, the history of the Spanish-speaking people taken into our country in our imperialist expansion. We are learning of the cultural genocide of the Indian boarding schools, which existed until the mid 20th century. That was I, in the lifetime uh, actually of everybody here, almost everybody, I don't know who's all here, but um, on this Zoom call, we have learned that, you know what? A lot of the cowboys were black and Mexican and Indian. Holy Zane Gray, that's not what we learned in the movies. No, we are a nation of immigrants. Well, the Beacon Press has recently published a book entitled, Not a Nation of Immigrants, subtitle, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of, Ra of Erasure and Exclusion. Uh, it's by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Uh, it's, the book is described as debunks the pervasive and self-congratulatory myth that our country is proudly founded by and for immigrants and urges readers to embrace a more complex and honest history of the United States. Same author is the author of An Indigenous People's History of the United States. So, it's not just slavery and the role of African Americans that's under scholarly revision, but the role of everybody, and particularly those everyones that many of us didn't learn about when we studied history in school, such as Native Americans and the Spanish speaking peoples of the Southwest. As you might imagine, this is a complex history. And it makes storytelling difficult. We like clear narratives because it tells us who we are uh, and who we were. If you, you know, if you see us as a largely benevolent society, well, much of the not so new history tells us that we weren't always such a benevolent society, and that some of these not so nice things were not accidental or sporadic or inconsequential, but were carefully and deliberately baked into the fabric of our society. So that even those of us who might not share the values of say racism and white supremacy, even us, even we might benefit uh, from these, these impulses that we are mortally opposed to. And we are, even we, are formed by it and benefit from it, and in many ways, both large and small, immersed in it. And as you unfortunately don't need to imagine, this new truth arouses people who cannot accept this new view of their country, and perhaps of themselves who cannot accept that, you know, and it creates a new cause for grievance. Hence, the entirely manufactured controversy over critical race theory. CRT is, is just a convenient handle for those who want to deny history. How we view our history is yet another way we exhibit the great divisions in our country. In shorthand terms, the revealing question is, what do you think about the removal of Confederate monuments? Or to add another category, what do you think about the removal of statues of Christopher Columbus? Writers of all stripes 
have called for a new national history, a new national story. Carl Degler himself, back in 1986, challenged his fellow historians, saying that, quote, if we historians fail to provide a nationally defined history, others less critical and less informed will take over the job for us, close quote. And just a few years later, a Harvard professor and New Yorker writer, uh, Jill Lepore, writing in Foreign Affairs, called for, uh, the title of her article was, A New Americanism, Why a Nation Needs a National Story. Well, I've quoted a couple of historians just now, but this isn't just a matter for historians looking for new ways to do what historians like to do. This is significant because history just doesn't tell us what happened, but it forms our image of who we are and what we are and what a society should be. And the task can be consequential and of great importance for our time. Uh, Justin E. Smith, a professor of philosophy, prophetically wrote in the New York Times in the summer of 2016, and you can remember back what was going on in the summer of 2016, we were having a presidential election then. Professor Smith writes, the task that, that faces American voters in the present moment is enormous to save the United States from the same post-democratic order to which parts of Europe and most of Asia has already fallen. Our relationship to history will play no small role in this. History may be rooted in storytelling, but we can summon it to be something else, the arbiter of truth against lies told in the pursuit of power. And we have certainly seen four years of that. So what is our story? What is the American story? I've come to the conclusion that there is no story. That is, there is no one story. We have a rich braid of stories that tell the story of this very, this tell the stories of this very fortunate piece of geography that we call the United States. And that's a third way of looking at our history. You know, early I talked about ways of telling our story. There's the one that many of us learned in school, although I realize that some of you watching this are, are young enough to have learned a better history. Uh, and there's a complex story of, the, the second thing is the complex story of colonization and oppression and exploitation. Both of these stories are essentially morality plays, good and bad struggling with the narrative. Well, there's a third way, and it's not original to me, but it's one I very much like, and that is to study our history, to tell our tales, just as we would tell the history of almost every other country that we look at. We tell it as what happened to a particular piece of geography. That is, start with the landforms, the mountains, the lakes, the rivers, the prairies, the, you know, the geography, the natural resources, the nature. Start with these things that made the place what it is. And then go to the successive waves of migration from the beginning of human habitation, which would mean telling our story from the time when peoples began crossing what we now call the Bering Strait and moving south down into that landmass we now call the Americas and study the civilizations that they established. And only after this do we come from that invasion from Europe that begins in the late 15th century. Yes, the story of our part of North America uh, for the past 400 years has been shaped by settlers from, from Europe and especially from the British Isles. You know, we speak English. Our culture is predominantly Christian. For now, most of the peoples are white. 
Culturally, we are part of Western and specifically European culture. But we don't study English history, for example. We don't study English history with beginning with the Norman invasion of 1066. There, you know, true, there existed an Anglo-Saxon culture there at a similar stage of development, but the invasion brought great changes in language, law, and governance to that place of geography, that piece of geography. Those of you who eat meat uh, call cattle beef because of that invasion. That woof from the, the French word. But, but there was a deep history before 1066. And there was a deep history in North America before 1607, when the first Englishmen, and they were all men in that first group, uh, arrived in the settlement they called Jamestown. For that matter, there was a great history and a great civilization before that small group of Spanish explorers arrived in 1492. Furthermore, our story is a part of world history. There are terrible things in our history, but sadly, they are not uniquely terrible. People have behaved terribly from the earliest recorded times. The, the New England Puritans saw their behavior as a reenactment of the Israelites' conquest of Canaan. The Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians built empires. The Mughals conquered India. The Mongolian hordes of Genghis Khan overran much of Asia and part of Europe. The Han Chinese expanded north and south and, and, and west. Uh, Arabs expanded Islam throughout North Africa into uh, uh, throughout North Africa and into Spain, as well as north and east into Asia. We can add the 19th century expansion of the Zulu kingdom. Uh, we can talk about the Aztec and Inca empires. Sad to say, this is what cultures do. Expansionist Western culture from the 15th century on is not unique. Similarly, slavery was, sadly, still is, widely practiced. In the great and horrific centuries of the transatlantic slave trade, everybody who could profited from the action, starting with the Africans who captured and sold other Africans, got into the action. Spain extracted a fortune in gold and silver from its New World possessions, but the real and lasting wealth came from the labor they extracted from the populations they conquered. Now, I say none of this as an excuse for bad behavior. This is not a everybody does it excuse. It's only a kind of forward to taking a broad look uh, at the uh, complex uh, complexities of history. It's also something we have to think about as religious people who are concerned about the making of a better society. Getting back to our exclusively American story, oops, sorry, stories, we see lots of good and bad things happening at once, threads woven together. We all have to face the dilemma of dealing with the knowledge that, you know, we lead pretty good lives today that were made possible perhaps centuries ago by the disposition of others. What do we do with that knowledge? Many congregations and even radio programs such as uh, Krista Tibbetts on Being acknowledge the people who at one time possessed the land under and around them. This sometimes is a pro forma kind of thing, but I think it's good to do. But while we might not be responsible for the original sins, the racism, the slavery, the slaughter of native peoples, and the cultural annihilation of, 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 their, of, of their cultures, we inherit the sin in a society in which we now live. Some of us have benefited from these horrible actions, such as the intergenerational transfer of wealth as our parents, if we were white, if we are white, we're able to buy homes in areas that depreciated, while others of us, if we are African American, are part of families who were shunted to areas that declined in values, 
often as the result of the white actions by the white power structure. As an aside, this same historical knowledge tells us that poor people of whatever race have suffered from government policies that result in, in such ills as environmental degradation. Because of these deep, deeply rooted historical inequalities, you know, it really seems kind of too mild to call them inequalities. It is important to get the details of our story right. For example, believing a wrong and false story, such as the lost cause of the Confederacy, has terrible consequences for American society and particularly for African Americans. Now, certainly we don't need history to look around and see things that need fixing. Even if we knew nothing of the history of racism in the Americas, the George Floyd killing would have cried out for outrage. But knowing that history is important, giving it context and clarifying that this was not a one-off unique situation by just some bad apple cop. Historical knowledge ties it to myriad other ills, such as the underfunding of education in black communities and poor public transportation and on and on. We might be, and we should be outraged by the situation of migrants and asylum seekers on our Southern border. But I think it makes a difference in how we look at things if we look at the plight of, for example, of Haiti and the Haitians, if we know how, his, how both in history and the present day, US policy has contributed to their poverty. And it makes a difference to know that our immigration laws that created barriers to Mexicans uh, our immigration laws have created barriers for Mexicans to, to obtain citizens. You can come from Europe and become a citizen easily in the course of American history, but not from Mexico. Did you know that it was only in the Clinton administration that the traditional border crossing for employment and returning back to Mexico or Central America became criminalized? That that was a standard thing until the Clinton administration. Uh, Aviva Chomsky has written a, an important book called Undocumented, How Immigration Became Illegal, another Beacon Press book published about six years ago. I think it also makes a difference if we know that almost every injustice we have had in our history that we can think of, have that, that people have fought against those things. History shows that not everybody went along with a certain way to do things. History shows that some people stood outside their community's practice and said, this is wrong. The very first published anti-slavery document in this country was Samuel Sewell's pamphlet called The Selling of, Ice, or the Selling of Joseph, a memorial just a three-page pamphlet published in 1700 in Boston where people own slaves. There's, you know, it's little evidence that people paid much attention to it, but there is evidence that somebody spoke out against slavery. Certainly this raising of the voice has been a part of ethical culture since our very beginning. To be clear, I'm not saying that we've been perfect, that we've been a band of saints and martyrs standing against the evils of our age, uh, but creating a better society has always been about something that we do. Not only can we make a difference in the world, but we believe that we must be actively engaged in the world. This is where our faith comes to fruition. We believe we become our best selves by struggling with the, uh, uh, with the problems of our community and by the engagement of the personalities, you know, the engagement of our personalities with the personalities of others. This was the message of Felix Adler and it's been the message of ethical culture since then. 
Jerome Nathanson, then one of the leaders of the New York Society for Ethical Culture in the mid 20th century. Uh, that was back in the 20th century rather, but it speaks to us today. When he said that only by participating one way or another uh, in the social problems so besetting us, can we go ahead with our own development, our own education, our own ethical sensitivity. We clarify the ethical stake, he wrote, by participating. I think the deep message of most religions, including our own, is pay attention. I frequently quote uh, Rabbi Abraham J. Heschel on this. He wrote that what impairs our sight are habits of seeing as well as the mental concomitants of seeing. Our sight is suffused with knowing instead of feeling painfully the lack of knowing what we see. The principle to be kept in mind is to know what we see rather than to see what we know. I say that again because I like it. You know, the principle to be kept in mind is to know what we see, not just see what we know. And I think that is also the lesson of history, or at least of the historian. We think we know so much, but much of what we know to, to create a to quote a whole bunch of uh, late 19th century humorists, uh, a lot of what we know just ain't so. Historians help us to uncover the truth, or at least the truth for our generation, the truth that awaits further examination and recovery. Now, this might be paradoxical, but I'm talking about history in the context of the future. You know, hey, I'm a historian. I love studying the past. The past is really neat for its own sake. But my concern this morning is our present and future. Knowing the past, the best we can know it, can help us see our present and can help us work to create the kind of future that we want. I'm not here just this morning just as a historian. I'm an ethical culture leader and a UU minister. You are here, I presume, because you are interested in making a better society. What you do here is work on your vision of the society of the future and get inspiration and the skills to work toward that vision. That's our responsibility. We are not responsible for the sins of the past. We are, however, responsible for the present, which means that we are responsible for the future. We might not be able to create the kind of future that we want to create but we will be, it will be a better future for our tribe. Whatever we do, we will be history makers. Let future historians look back at us and say, you know, they did a good job back then. Thank you very much, Mike, for that thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. After some music, we'll have community sharing time where you can write in the chat about what resonated with you today. In this time between, you might prepare for community sharing by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at West that illustrates the values we're lifting up today. As we contemplate, rest and reflect, let us enjoy the musical response from Leah Morris. Doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you need or what you're going through. Don't you hold it all in because everybody ought to see. Don't let your truth be drowned out. Yours is a voice you need. We need to hear you. We need to know you. Show us your dance. Cause everyone I see. Sing out your song now. Tell us your story. Live in your own way. Part of our history. It doesn't matter.
matter where you go It doesn't matter where you've been Or who will shut you out Cause we are gonna let you in It doesn't matter what you know You are fruit from our family tree Shout your truth to the rafters Yours is a voice you need This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates in our own lives. I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching the recording later. Let me see what I can see in the chat. Um, Things moving by pretty quickly. Um, Wayne says, wonderful platform calling us to see and act on our principles and values. Loretta says, excellent platform. Surprised, however, that he didn't mention the book by James Lowen, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong, first published in 1995 on the bestseller list and updated in 2018. He says, telling me truth about the past can help us make it right from here on. Uh, Adam Limehouse is great platform today. Uh, from John Dakin, there's a tribal museum near where I grew up that tells the story of Europeans' arrival from the perspective of indigenous people. Hmm. And he's got a link there to a video from that museum, I take it. Um, and Adam Limehouse mentions another reference, a people's history of the United States. Wayne says, loved, know what we see, don't see what we know. Give people another a moment or two to chime in here. Well, uh, that may be it for now, uh, but folks can certainly continue to add their thoughts. Oh, here's one other. Oh, okay. Uh, Jeff Mehal, wow, what a platform. Unfortunately, history is often taught as if it is linear in fashion when in fact it zigs and zags all over the place. The old saying, if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you are. If you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. And Maceo says, James Lowen was scheduled for this Sunday, actually. He passed away a few months ago. Oh my goodness. One of his students will be here in early 2022. Good to know. Uh, that gives me a transition into talking about our other coming attractions. But first, just as we share our perspectives in community, so too do we share our material gifts. Here at WES, we split the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. We appreciate each person's generous giving as they are able. This month, half of the offering is dedicated to Food Justice DMV, that of course stands for District Maryland and Virginia, 
Food Justice DMV provides meals and essential products to 172,000 families, mainly undocumented neighbors who, are less, who have less access to other kinds of food aid and COVID relief. The organization remains all volunteer. Our own Ross Wells reminds us that Wes has been part of Food Justice DMV from the beginning, providing volunteers and funds to support our immigrant neighbors throughout the pandemic. The pandemic is not over and our help is still needed. On the slide, you'll see the number to give by text for today's collection. That's 202-335-1885. And you can also make a gift online through the donate button on West website at ethicalsociety.org. We will now receive your gifts and the gift of music from Bad Snacks. Thank you so much to the many people who helped create this morning's time together. Of course, our speaker, Mike French, interim music coordinator, Leah Morris, guest musicians, Dr. Issei Barnwell and Bad Snacks, membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, slide artists, John and Abby Dakin, and communications coordinator, Robin Kravitz, who will be hosting today's Zoom coffee hour. And of course, thank you to today's tech team, without whom you would be hearing and seeing nothing. John Pfeiffer, John Lika, Michael Dimion, Pat McNeely, and Paul Baker. Thanks also, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks also to those who are leading and supporting our work in the weeks to come. As always, this week has a variety of opportunities for West members and friends to connect virtually around shared interests and in support meetings and discussion groups. For example, the Science Fiction Book Club, sorry, Adam, I can't call it sci-fi. Uh, book club meets today at 1 p.m., and I believe the improv group will meet Thursday evening at 7.30. You can find links in the Sunday links or news and notes emails. Looking ahead to next Sunday, December 5th, the pre-K to second grade class and the neighboring faiths middle school class will meet during platform. OWL will meet later that afternoon as scheduled. Please be sure your family is registered and that you have filled out the RSVP form for each class session. If you aren't already receiving the SEEK newsletter, please contact Indara Miles. The platform address next Sunday will be by Interim Leader Lynn Cox on the topic, Finding Peace. We hope that you'll join us for that at 1030, either on Zoom or here in the hall if you reserve your spot online. As the saying goes, good seats are still available. Again, the link for reservations for December's platforms is on the West website and the details on other events, as are the details on other events and news. Uh, you'll need to answer health screening questions and to confirm your answers to those questions when you arrive. One more note, 
the West office remains closed Monday and Tuesday as business administrator Tom Hutton takes a well-deserved break. The office will reopen on December 1st. We're nearing the end of platform, whether you've been with us live on Zoom as a volunteer in the hall or later on the recording, thank you for being here with us. After the closing song and closing words, we'll end this webinar and open up a new Zoom meeting for virtual coffee hour. One of the breakout rooms in the coffee hour will be for our guests from Long Island, giving them a chance to catch up with each other. Now let's enjoy this month's clothing song from interim music coordinator, Leah Morris. Does love slide flicker when we fear danger? Could we see no stranger? Does hope fruit wither when we resist change? Might we see no stranger? They all share one history. One voice rings out in the dark See no stranger, no stranger See no stranger If we all share one mother of blue, pearl, and space few brief reminders as we close. If you're new to our community, please send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, and introduce yourself. To reach Virtual Coffee Hour, point your browser to tiny.cc slash westcoffeehour. That's one word. And thank you for being part of this experimental platform. Whether online or in person, we'll see you again soon. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words for the month. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment, remembering the past and preparing for the future in our quest for a better world. <laughs>